Well, my name is Travis Doucet, and I'm excited to be here today with my friend Tom Brooks. And uh, this is something that we did about 10 years ago, isn't it, Tom? It has it been 10 years? <laughs> it's, it might be even more than 10 years. But the purpose of today is to really talk about how the Lord has used Tom in the formation of contemporary praise and worship music and to really tell his story and the intersection of God using his gifts as a producer and arranger um, to really establish uh, Integrity's Hosanna music. And so uh, let's just dive right in. Tom, bring us back to the genesis of Hosanna music. Tell us the story of how it all began and how you came to be involved and, and how many projects you did. Well, how long do you have here, Travis? Uh, <laughs> This, this is one of those stories that obviously, you know, I'll, I'll try to condense as best I can, but uh, it, it really coincides with the whole uh, beginnings of the praise and worship movement. Uh, this is back in, uh, I want to say, early 70s to mid 70s. Uh, and, you know, as a teenage kid, as a musician, I had one of the very, very early four-track recorders. It's a TAC four-track. And at that time, when it came to recording music, man, that was state-of-the-art. Uh, Quarter-inch tape, and I had some good friends uh, that were part of a, uh, I don't even want to call it a church. It was part of a gathering of Christians that really just met, uh, they literally met in a firehouse on a concrete floor. A couple of guys had guitars. And uh, they would write some songs based on scripture. They, you know, they would travel to another city, find another similar group, learn a song there, bring it back here. And uh, these guys invited me to come with my four track and a couple of the mics I had and record their music. And that evolved uh, like it evolved in a lot of other cities around America. You know, the Jesus movement just exploded. And it was... Uh, you know, when I say it wasn't a church, I mean, it was much more disorganized, informal. Hey, where can we meet next week? Oh, my gosh, we, we're starting to bother the neighbors in the neighborhood parking all the cars. We got to. And therefore, the leaders started to kind of rise up out of this. So really, I got sucked into the whole Jesus movement uh, that way. And as it developed that little enclave developed into very, very quickly, as a matter of fact, a, a fairly legitimate, uh, I don't want to say legitimate, but you know, more of an organized church. Uh, the membership exploded. I mean, you know, at the beginning, we're talking 15, 20, 25 people, depending on the night of the week. And uh, it exploded into a 2,000 and 3,000 and 5,000 member church. So, uh, I'd been recording the music all through that time, and as it evolved, uh, by the time we got to the name of the church at that point was Grace World Outreach Center, because all the cool churches in that era were World Outreach Center, right? Um, and we were still really doing the same thing. That was capturing the music. By that point, I bought two more of those TAC 3340s. That'd be a great graphic to pull up because most people would look at that and go, what? Um, and synchronization of those three machines was as simple as there was no synchronization. It wasn't even invented yet. So it was kind of like finger on the play button, finger on the play button, toe on the play button, go. And it would stay close in sync for about a minute and a half as you're mixing all those tracks down to the final master. Then you have to start over, resync and then cut those pieces together. That's how all those early albums were made. Um, but uh, by the time we got to Grace, uh, we were getting fairly involved, fairly sophisticated. I'd also started to arrange a lot of the music, uh, started to play keyboards on a lot of the music. Uh, I was in college. A lot of my college professors were members of the St. Louis Symphony Orchestra. This all happened in St. Louis, by the way. So I started inviting them to come to these recording. Usually we would record at our big conference every year. So we actually had an orchestra with our praise band. Uh, so these things became fairly elaborate. And there were a couple of albums we did that fell into the hands of some great brothers from down in Alabama, Mike Coleman and Ed Lindquist. 
and uh, they ran the, the magazine. It was a magazine called New Wine, which was basically a kind of a spokesman piece for a group of pastors. And uh, they were doing, the magazine kind of run its course. It, they had a couple of issues left. And this particular issue, it was like the second to last, third to last issue. It was all about worship. So they would found our cassette tape. They loved it just on a personal level. Contacted me, said, hey, could we, you know, Jack Hayford's on the cover. You've got this album, Behold His Majesty. It features his song. Could we put in an ad for your cassette tape? your worship album, uh, it would seem like a perfect thing. We think our readership would love it. So I said, absolutely. Uh, I forget the quantity, but we pressed up a bunch of them, sent them down there. And they sold a boatload of them, more than they would have guessed. And really, the, the thing I love about integrity, I wasn't really called integrity at that point, it was Hosanna. Uh, Hosanna music, it wasn't like somebody, some business executive got out the whiteboard and decided, hey, perfect idea. Let's get a subscription-based thing and let's contact them directly. Let's skip over the retail. No, this was absolutely a God plan that nobody saw coming. Uh, the only reason why we started producing worship albums every eight weeks is because the magazine went out every eight weeks. And when the magazine finally came to a close, Mike Coleman and Ed Lindquist basically said to me, look, Tom, if you could actually produce a new worship album every eight weeks, we've got all these people out there that are expecting a magazine every eight weeks. What about if we offered them a worship album instead of a magazine? We'll send it to them for free, for free. They get to listen to it. If they like it, they pay. If they don't like it, they send it back. What do you think? So, you know, being the, call it crazy, call it whatever you want to. I mean, I wasn't about to say nobody can produce an album every eight weeks. Are you crazy? I said, absolutely, let's do it. So that's really the whole reason why Hosanna started as an every eight week subscription-based um, worship album program. And that... Uh, that basic system stayed in place for, gosh, you might know better than I, 15 or 20 years. So very much a God plan, very much the sort of thing that no human on earth could take credit for. Uh, but it really was part of the beginning of this huge praise and worship explosion that we're still in the, in the throes of that. Grace Outreach Center seem to be a place with a, a prolific and a very influential worship culture. Were there other worship projects outside of the Hosanna projects that you were involved in even prior to Behold His Majesty? And what were they? Um, well, the uh, like I say, I'm sure that there were groups of believers like ours in a lot of cities around the world. But the one that we were most familiar with was uh, actually out here in Southern California, uh, Calvary Chapel, Pastor Chuck Smith, uh, Tommy Coombs, a huge figure in uh, you know the early stages of praise and worship music. So they started Maranatha music, which uh, was probably a predecessor to us, I think. Um, you know, again, you kind of learned about each other by you had to travel. You know, you couldn't pop on the internet and, and look at Chuck's. Uh, you know, worship service like you can now. So, but we were very aware of Maranatha and Tommy Coombs had contacted me. So we were uh, getting involved in, in their worship culture as well. And, you know, obviously our whole thing, my whole thing was cross pollinating, you know, so we'd grab great songs from there. We would, you know, offer them some of our great songs. Each would give it their own particular treatment. Um, and we, we really did that around the world. Every church we went to, you know, we would, you know, try to give an opportunity for those songwriters to let their songs get out to the world. And, you know, we would bring in songs from our kind of collection of songwriters that we had going. So the whole idea was to enrich the whole process by cross-pollinating all these different flavors of worship cultures around the world. 
some people would be interested to hear what um, the first track on that first Hosanna, well, not official Hosanna, we'll talk about that in a second, but that first yeah. album distributed by Hosanna Music, Behold His Majesty. And I have a clip I'm going to pull up, and I would just love to play a segment <laughs> of it and to get, get your reaction. So this is from, I believe, 1982-83, and this is uh, the opening track off Behold His Majesty. This is Ron Tucker leading uh, Jack Hayford's song, Majesty. Let's have a listen. So that would have been the first song that people would have heard when they subscribed to this brand new tape, worship tape distribution, uh, you know, subscription service. That's the first track off of Behold His Majesty. Tell me, Tom, what do you recall about the night that you recorded that? And what do you remember about the night, the songs, and, and even Pastor Ron Tucker's leadership? Travis, you're, you're cracking me up, man. When I, when I listen to that intro, now, first of all, you got to think of how many years removed we are from the guy, the me that arranged that intro, I'm, I'm listening to that thinking, I must have seen a Star Wars movie the night before I arranged that or something. <laughs> how old were you then and how old are you now? So I am, uh, we talking chronologically or psychologically? <laughs> Chron how, many, how many birthdays have you had? <laughs> yeah, I've been around the sun uh, at this point 67 times, I think. Okay. right now so I'd have to do the math you know so I was probably 28 then okay. uh, somebody can fact check my math there but um, <laughs> yeah now, again as I said a minute ago you know I had all of my professors from college who were in the St. Louis Symphony there so obviously I was going to do something that was going to feature the orchestra well and I kind of wanted to feature them right out of the gate. So right out of the gate, you would know the scope of what this whole night was going to be, right? Um, so I, I do remember that. The, the night that this happened, you have to understand, this is in the middle of a conference. It's like a five-day conference when uh, Pastor Ron Tucker was the pastor of Grace World Outreach Center. Just a really, really incredible guy, powerful figure in my life. Um, he had this conference that drew all these great leaders. So this is night after night after night of music. Uh, I don't remember exactly, but the chances are we might have even done this two nights. Uh, I don't know about this album, but definitely the album that followed we did so that I had two takes of every song to choose from, right? Not to get crazy technical, but... Um, but, okay, so you're in the midst of a huge conference. We have guests from all over the country. At this point, this is a 5,000-seat sanctuary. Uh, it's chaos without the idea of recording, right? It's chaos from the standpoint of I've got brand new music that I'm playing and conducting and recording. And I'm bringing in an orchestra, which obviously I can't pay for a lot of rehearsal time with these professional people. So I've got to accomplish a ton in a very short period of time. <laughs> Setting up to record orchestra, if anybody on the technical side knows, that is a huge mountain to climb in the best of circumstances. So if you ask me my memory of that night, 
blur probably is the first word that comes to mind um, but I mean it was an incredible night obviously super super powerful you know people were sort of flipping out just because you know you rarely get to have that kind of a worship experience so it's not just the sound you know we had an enormous praise choir that was backing up worship singers our band this orchestra was down in front of the stage so uh, yeah it was it was pretty mind-boggling you know powerful spiritual one now my understanding is uh, the first two Hosanna projects behold his majesty with Ron Tucker and let praise arise with John Sellers were independently produced projects just distributed by Hosanna what was right. the first official project produced who is the worship leader and what's the story about how that initial project came together well Travis some of the stuff I'm going to trust you more than I'm going to trust me uh, but uh, I think that I mean basically after the first two uh, that already existed Mike and Ed Mike Coleman Ed Linquist came to me and said these have been super successful our you know our magazine subscribers love this time to shut the magazine down uh, could you produce one of these, a worship tape of that scope, of that caliber, specifically for us? And, you know, with the thought of continuing this subscription. So I'm pretty sure that was called All Hail King Jesus. Is that right? That's correct. So, and that would have featured another great lifelong friend of mine, uh, Kent Henry, uh, who is also part of that same church. So really, we're, we're at this point, we're just producing these out of our church. And uh, it was another similar scope. I can't remember if, if we had orchestra on that one or not. I think we probably did, actually. Um, but that would have been the first official album that we did specifically for Mike and Ed, uh, for Hosanna Music. And do you remember the response from that first one? I'm sure having distributed the first two, there might have been a sense of, okay, well, let's try this. But now you're actually creating new content. Right. It's the first time, diving off the deep end. What was the response to All Hail King Jesus? You know, uh, I love the way that Mike Coleman describes it. He would always say, like, the train has left the station. Like, we're running as fast as we can to catch up. So every time we released... Uh, a praise and worship album, the sales at that beginning stage kind of doubled. And so that, you know, it was running away logarithmically. And the, uh, what seemed at the beginning to be just kind of a natural, you know, we do a magazine every eight weeks, so let's just do an album every eight weeks. You know, God is up in heaven looking down going, <laughs> you know, uh, that's insane. But we kind of committed to that. So, as you can imagine, right out of the gate, uh, you know, you didn't have much time to catch your breath after the, you know, the, as the last chord is fading on the one, you've really got to dive into the next one. And we started overlapping simply so we'd have more than eight weeks, you know, in, in terms of pre-production. We're getting to know a whole new worship leader. We're getting to know a whole new church. We're finding 10 or 12 or 14 new songs. So we actually started to you know, sort of work in a cycle that still went out every eight weeks. But, you know, we would start the beginnings more like two units, three units ahead of time, just so we could be not quite so crazy and stressed when we got to the recording. There's a handful of worship leaders that you seem to regularly use back in the day, and Ken Henry was one of them. I want to play just yeah. a, a short clip from a, a later album that you recorded with uh, with Ken Henry, probably um, a, a song um, that he made popular that that probably had a national, if not a multinational, uh, platform. This is uh, just a short clip to get your reaction. This is Ken Henry leading the song uh, "Awesome in This Place." <laughs>
Now, obviously, uh, by the time this project came out, um, more of a band-driven thing, a little, little less orchestra. Um, what are your memories when you hear that song? Well, Kent is one of the unique people in the world of praise and worship. Uh, you know, it's, it's easy to kind of throw around the word uh, anointing if you're in the circles who that would even understand that word. But uh, God kind of just came out of every pore of Ken Henry pretty much 24-7. Uh, <laughs> I remember one morning where, you know, I'd been working in the studio all night long with uh, the worship leader, and we decided to knock on Kent's door of his house at about 5.30 a.m. and, uh, you know, woke his sweet wife out of bed. And uh, literally within about five minutes, Kent is just exploding with the presence of God. He just lived in that mode. So uh, I think we might have done, how many albums did we do with Kent? Five or six, maybe? I think he did about six. Yeah, six with yeah. Kent. But uh, yeah, he was a huge, powerful figure in that whole movement. I sort of feel like maybe he would be one of those guys that uh, really very much not a self-seeking guy, you know, and in some ways I think that uh, his impact on the praise and worship movement is probably overlooked uh, in terms of the number of other worship leaders that he inspired, that he made room for. Uh, very, very powerful guy, lifelong friend, um, and all the albums we did with him, you know, the albums were really the night. It's basically, it's a praise and worship celebration. It's the experience. We, we try to treat the recording as somewhat secondary. So from a producer standpoint, that's interesting because, you know, you do find decisions you have to make where you're sort of favoring one over the other. But uh, we really try to stay true to the fact that people are coming, believers are coming with an expectation. We really want the evening itself to be powerful. And we're trusting the fact that you know, God's going to allow us to kind of capture the presence of God in that. And that when the dust settles, you know, we're going to have something captured on tape that is still going to bless people, even if they couldn't be there. And every single one of those nights with Kent was absolutely epic. And we, we have to highlight again that it's Kent Henry leading on the very first Hosanna Project. Right. Um, and, and so did you come to choose him just because you were in relationship with him at your church? Was he just kind of the obvious choice for that first project? Yeah, yeah, he really was. So uh, we had just done Ron Tucker. So, I mean, in that one church, it, it, I, I say this to my students here at the university, you've got to look around the room right now and realize the fact that in 10 years, in 15 years, you could be sitting next to somebody that, God's just using across the planet. So here we are in our little, I mean, these guys were all there in the firehouse. These guys were all there when it was 20, 30 people. And, you know, you realize now that God just surrounded us with a bunch of incredibly gifted, talented, beautiful, anointed people. And so we had just done the album with Ron. So uh, Kent was kind of the obvious choice for this, uh, for this next one. Take us into the early days of planning meetings for Hosanna Music Projects. How were churches, songs, and worship leaders chosen for projects? Mm -hmm. Well, we, uh, you know, we had this eight-week cycle. So we're producing a, a new album every eight weeks. And the routine that we got into was um, uh, Mike Coleman, Ed Lindquist, and pretty quickly Don Moen. Uh, another brother uh, in the early days named Garrett Gustafson. They would all come to my house in St. Louis at that point. We were in St. Louis. And we would spend the better part of a week, usually at least four days. Uh, one of those days would be focused on the current album that we just recorded. I had just mixed. It was a session where the guys would have one final chance to listen to my mix of that project, maybe make a few final tweaks sometimes. Uh, so day one is, is that current album that's got to go out in a few days. The second day is more about the next album that's coming. Uh, now, 
hopefully by that point, we've already done a lot of preliminary work. So that second day is really, okay, in about four weeks from now, we're gonna be in Orlando, Florida, or Cape Town, South Africa, wherever it might be. Flights, who needs to go? Do you have the remote, you know, I mean, that's a lot of getting ready for that recording. Third day is more about, uh, hey, you know, we have another worship leader who's going to fly in. We're thinking of him for the album after Cape Town, right? And sometimes we might meet two worship leaders on that third day. So you see what I'm saying? Like there's a day devoted to the emergency that's right in front of our face. It's got to go out. Second day is sort of like planning the recording that's coming in four weeks. Third day is thinking of the next one. And then the fourth day is really, okay, we've talked to our gang of songwriters. We have about 100 songs that we need to listen through. Uh, and literally, that would be a, a <laughs> just like it sounds, pour through the songs. And everything from the cheap cassette player sitting on top of the upright piano with the baby crying in the background, those kind of song demos to, you know, live things from a church meeting, et cetera, et cetera. So we would pour through songs and try to pick out the ones that we thought, you know, might fit on a Hosanna. And we did, we did that sort of weekly meeting every eight weeks as well. Do you have a recollection of a song that maybe didn't initially have a great demo, but you saw the potential in it? I'm sure there's lots, but maybe a song that ended up having a, a national or international platform? Uh, yeah, there, there are a lot of funny, uh, funny song stories. Um, the, uh, gosh, I mean, the one pretty interesting one that everybody knows of is, is a song called Give Thanks, which uh, everybody thinks that Don Moen wrote because uh, it's a big song of Don's. He actually didn't write that. Um, the name of the actual Henry, writer. Henry Smith. Yeah, Henry Smith. Um, so that was one of those absolutely crazy, you know, unpolished demos. But, you know, both for both Don and I, that really rang true. And, and he actually, as a guest at that conference that I'm talking about, Don Moen would come to that conference at Grace World Outreach Center as a guest. Actually, he was the musical guest of a pastor named Terry Law, if that name sounds at all familiar, uh, who is another great uh, speaker who understood worship and the word. That's one of the big strengths, I would say, of, of Pastor Ron Tucker, is that it wasn't like, and we've kind of, I always hate to generalize, but we've sort of fallen into this trap of, here's the worship, Da, 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 thank you very much. Shut that down. Now here's the word. You know, worship is done. Pastor, thank you very much. Get out of my way. Here comes the pastor. Here comes the word. Uh, Ron, that's way over, way overstatement, but you know what I'm saying. Ron Tucker was the worship leader and the pastor. So there was never any line of demarcation where the worship stopped and the word started. All of the songs were really just contemporary rock versions of scripture for the most part. So, you know, Ron, we'd be singing a song, you know, Ron would stop or maybe the band would just vamp and Ron would expound and, and preach and talk about where that came from and why, gosh, if you're stressed out in your life, it's no wonder. Return unto your rest. And, you know, he would take the song and make it meaningful. And the music is still moving. So uh, I'm off on a tangent on you, but uh, no, give, me back, give me back to the question. That's great. So as you would receive like hundreds of tapes to consider songs, what does it say about the role of a producer to be able to hear past a demo to the potential that a song can have? Because a lot of us, yeah. you know, the famous story of, uh, you know, Darling Check playing Shout to the Lord for Jeff Bullock and told, telling him to turn his back to the wall because she's so embarrassed and she's clunking out the chords. And, <laughs> and he has the ability to turn around and, and prophetically say that song is going to be sung around the world. Yeah. Well, t talk to us a little bit about the producer's role in hearing yeah. the potential for a song. Well, it, it is a big, big uh, challenge. And, and just to tie that last rant together, 
so Don Mullen was the, the worship leader for Terry Law, this pastor that would come and, and you know, a lot of his talk was about worship and about identifying a worship song that is really going to touch people. And, uh, you know, we're all humans, and part of our human nature is to, to compare, right? And you really have to, to answer your question, you have to understand the part of you that is looking for a song that sounds just like the latest, coolest pop song that's a big hit on the radio versus the content of a song that just has inherent power. It doesn't matter who's playing and it doesn't matter the quality. If you listen to the lyric and if you listen to just the content of the melody and how well that's married to the lyric and how powerfully it sinks that lyric into your heart, that's really where the power is. So if you want to know like what a perfect song is, it's like, well, perfect to who? Perfect from God's perspective or perfect from a radio DJ perspective? Uh, and that's kind of what the producer has to do. So we would sit in those meetings and, you know, Don and I are just like looking at each other. Okay, yeah, that totally sounds like this new Phil Collins hit song. But this one over here, there's something in that. And, you know, it's that intangible factor. If this was nothing but ones and zeros, if it was an equation, if it was an algorithm, everybody on the planet would be doing it. But it's just a sense that that lyric is touching me big time right now. And I have a sense that it's going to touch a lot of people. And that's sort of end of story. At that point, if, if just the simple lyric and melody together is good, then you shift from producer mode to arranger mode and say, okay, how do I take those simple components and really present that to people in a way that they can easily accept, they can easily get it. All of the power that's in there is really coming through 100%. You mentioned, uh, you know, the privilege it must have been to meet a lot of worship and work with a lot of worship leaders over, yeah. over this time. Um, who is a worship leader that made uh, uh, an impression upon you upon the first time meeting them? <laughs> oh, gosh. Uh, yeah, it, it's been an incredible privilege. I'll say that uh, all of the worship leaders that I work with on those albums are some of the greatest people on the planet, still some of my great friends to this day. Ron Cannoli would be one of the very, very powerful ones. Uh, still a good friend to this day. Just really got what I was just saying a minute ago. How do I communicate this powerful truth to people in a way that's just going to make their lives better? Uh, Bob Fitz would be another guy. Uh, you know, I mean, it's a great question. Honestly, Travis, a lot of it is how these guys manifest what I think of as the personality or the characteristics of God, really. Uh, you know, Bob Fitz, for instance, is like the most humble, kind, generous, you know, we would joke and say, you know, Bob is like nicer than God, you know. <laughs> um, Ron would be one of those that it just has a boldness and a and just a kind of a reckless abandon about running into God's presence, you know. Uh, Ken Henry would be another one of those guys just absolutely fearlessly would, would run off a cliff for God without a hesitation. And, uh, you know, honestly, all those guys are, you know, people that, I mean, they're inspiring me. So part of the reason it's so much fun to produce them is because I'm sort of, uh, I'm an active participant in their journey, you know, and, you know, I'm looking behind me and saying, there's a lot of people like me that are ready to follow along. Um, and, you know, I mean, I'm leaving out a million of them, but uh, Graham Kendrick is another great one, really March for Jesus. You talk about people following a great leader. Uh, you know, he had such an influence on that. Um, gosh. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to leave out uh, a ton of my best friends, but uh, we were fortunate. I mean, God just kept bringing these people to us. There was no other formula other than, hey, you know, I went to this conference and there was this guy and uh, gosh, I heard this girl sing and she was just amazing. And 
God would just kind of bring these people across our path, thankfully, on kind of an every eight week basis. <laughs> I'll, I'll jog your memory with a couple of names from the early years. Charlie LeBlanc, huh. Lamar Boschman, yeah. Keith Sanchez Jr., uh, Hamlin, <laughs> Dan Gardner, David Butterbaugh, uh, David Groth, Randy Rock, yeah. Jim Gilbert, uh, <laughs> David Morris, Marty Nystrom, Dave Fellingham, Marty. Um, uh, Chris uh, Bowater, uh, I apologize. Bowater, yeah. Bowater, I'm yeah. Pro probably butchering some of these names. J. Daniel Smith. Uh, Virgil yeah. Mirez, uh, Robert Gay, uh, Eugene Greco, Billy Funk, Dave Pope. Um, you mentioned Ron Cannoli, Ian White. Those are, yeah. those are just a handful of names that you work with. Yeah, I mean, all of those guys, you know, obviously we had kind of a focused eight or 12 weeks with each of them. Uh, but yeah, every single one of those names are an incredible memory. Um, even some other, you know, international folks, you know, I think of uh, Alini Barros from uh, Rio, from Brazil, incredible worship leader still to this day, seven Grammys, uh, several Hispanic worship leaders that we work with that were terrific. Um, yeah, so there's just a great collection of, you know, Don and I joke about at some point, man, you know, we got to get all those people together in a room and uh, yeah, just sort of let it happen. Yeah, all the all those guys, just tremendous brothers and sisters. Great memories, epic nights of worship with all of them. So let's move into some technical questions. Um, for those who geek out over history, uh, these are some questions that have generated through the internet, but also have uh, captured my curiosity. So mm -hmm. it does appear that some projects were released for a, a UK market with a different worship leader. So I found this fascinating. Um, so you can find some Hosanna albums, same set of music, same arrangement, same band, different worship leader for the UK market. Do you remember what brought about the decision to do that? Um, you know, it, it's fun to sit back and sort of look at history. I mean, I'm, I'm kind of like you, Travis. I, I do love looking at history. I think it does give you some insight because, you know, God sees all of it at the same time. We kind of get our little 7,500 years. But um, when I look back at, at the history of it, in the beginning, nobody had any control over it. It was chase after God as fast as you can. Um, once anything grows, then it, it's funny, you know, I'm saying this in a completely no, no bias way. Like when you have nothing and God puts something in your hand, it's kind of like, man, I'm just keeping my hands open, you know, because he's pouring it in and there was nothing there to start with. It'd be silly of me to try to grab it, you know. Uh, but as soon as it turns into something and then you're looking at it and go, wow, there's a lot of, I've got some assets here. I've got some stuff. I should probably protect what I've got here. You know, I should probably. <laughs> so there's a human tendency. Once we kind of thought that we figured out what was going on. It's a roundabout answer again. Sorry. Um, so all that to say. You, you know, th there are companies that get formed around this explosion of God. And then when you form companies, then it's like the laws are different in that country. We should probably maybe form a separate company or maybe we should form an alliance with that established company that's already there that feels kind of like a good match, you know? So like it or not, all of those great explosive ideas of God tend to evolve into, I don't know what else to call it, a business entity. And I'm not saying that like that's a negative thing, but it just does, right? Happens to everything, happens to churches, happens to every great idea. And I think probably in that case, that was a period where we had an arrangement with uh, another company in the UK that was very much like us, but kind of had their own collection of worship leaders. So it just made more sense for them to take advantage of the tracks that I had produced, but to do it with a worship leader that is part of their gang of people. You know, 
I, I, I tend to think that's probably what happened there in the sense of the UK. Now, in the sense of there are many albums that you can find in different languages of tracks that I produced or, or you know, other folks at Integrity produced where you know, there might be a Hispanic worship leader. There might be a worship leader from another language. So that's, yeah, I mean, that's a little bit more obvious. But um, the, the way I, I look at it, uh, in any field, there are like the pioneers. Think of the Wild West, right? There are, uh, no, no, let's go back. Let's say the explorers. They're the people that go out there when there's nothing, you know? And then following the explorers, if the word gets back, then there are the pioneers. They kind of follow the trail of the explorers, right? And then the pioneers sort of set some stuff up, and the settlers kind of go, yeah, maybe we could make it out there. You know, there's a little town we could go to. And then the guy that owns the general store, the entrepreneurs say, hey, there's a couple of thousand people out in Dodge City or whatever it is. We should go out there and take our general store from St. Louis and open a branch there and sell picks and shit. That's kind of how every great idea is. That's kind of how the worship movement was. Go back to the firehouse, you know, Ron and Kent and Tommy Coombs and people like that around the world, those are like the explorers. They're just out there. There's no rules. There's no nothing. But they sense. And then the pioneers kind of follow. And then the settlers follow. And before you know it, now there's praise and worship is a business entity, you know. And it's not good or bad, but it's like the arc of what happens to great ideas. Not necessarily good or bad, not grousing, but uh, you kind of have to decide where you're comfortable. It's a little more exciting to be on the explorer pioneer end of things than to be on the settler entrepreneur end of things, I would say. But that's for me. <laughs> Some have noticed that a project in the US, uh, You Are My God, was recorded and released twice, once with Ron Tucker, who you have mentioned already, but yeah. then a second time with Jeff Hamlin. Do you remember the reasons surrounding why that happened? <laughs> Um, yeah, so again, the great part about looking back at history is uh, I can honestly say uh, I love all of the people that I got to work with through that entire thing. Uh, and that's, that's not a blanket statement. I mean, that's the absolute truth. Uh, along the way, you know, you're making a lot of creative decisions, right? And you got a lot of creative people, a lot of pretty, you know, high-powered creative people. Uh, and sometimes everybody doesn't see eye to eye. So I think what happened in that case was Ron felt like rather than, not unlike a church that we would just go to, thank you very much, and we're done, Ron sort of felt like at that point that maybe Hosanna Music was a little bit too much taking advantage of what was really maybe a, a product of grace of the church. You know what I mean? Now, obviously, that's a balanced thing. But as they were sort of negotiating that conversation, Ron felt like, you know, can you sort of see that picture? Because a lot, you know, that's grace is where I was. Uh, I was probably still there as a staff person while I was producing those early integrity records up to that point. And I think Ron felt like, you know, you guys are kind of just taking too much of, of us. You know, maybe we just want to distribute that album ourselves. You know, it's our Tom, it's our music director, it's our band, it's me, you know. So I think they couldn't really resolve that and the decision was, so Jeff was an assistant of mine uh, who also actually worked for Grace, but it's kind of like, you know, Ron just felt like, you know, I'm, I'm gonna sort of pull myself out of this. And, you know, we, we, we put Jeff in as a, as a substitute for Ron. But again, love all those guys in that equation, uh, but that's just, uh, you know, when you get down to family around the kitchen table, you don't always see eye to eye about, about everything. And uh, I think at the end of the day, looking back, everybody is happy to have been involved. But that was just one of those moments where they couldn't quite see eye to eye. So it, 
my understanding is that that album was released with Ron as the worship leader and then as Jeff as the worship leader. So did those conversations kind of happen after the fact? If that is true, that, that's not the way I remember it. But uh, I could be wrong. I've just noticed as I've looked at discography. I'm, I'm, I'm learning to trust you, Travis. You, you seem to know the details of this better than I do. Um, I'm not. It wouldn't have made sense to me if, if we would have released it with Ron's vocal. I will say this, there's album artwork for both worship leaders. Interesting. Yeah. I mean, one thing, one thing could be by that point. So in the very beginning, it's a side note that the retail people like the Christian bookstore, which is where you, most people would buy Christian music at that point. Well, at the early days, we're kind of like, we have no idea what to do with worship albums. You know, we have some Christian rock albums, but praise and worship, like people didn't even know that term. So they weren't interested in us at all. So it's kind of like, well, sort of a drag, but okay, we'll keep doing our subscription guys. But I'm thinking maybe by that point, the retail had finally started to notice, gosh, these guys are moving 100,000 units every eight weeks. We should probably look back in. Um, so it might've been a thing where we released Ron's to the subscription club, but then maybe that conversation got cooking, and by the time we released to retail, maybe we had changed the game plan. Possibly. That sounds plausible. It's interesting to pause here and just even talk about how formats have changed. Uh, the first two albums that were distributed by Hosanna Music, and I know we've talked about this offline, uh, Behold His Majesty with Ron Tucker yeah. and Let Praise Arise with John Sellers, uh, are both, you can find them to, the, to this day, on vinyl. And uh, I know that for the UK market, through some of my <laughs> research, that some of the... Uh, the albums that early albums that Graham Kendrick did um, for Hosanna Music were released on vinyl in the UK, if for any reason that that format held on just a little bit longer than it did in North America. Yeah. But um, this was largely in the day of cassette tapes, right? This is prior to the CD. Yes, uh, very much so. And uh, we've, we've had this conversation, uh, as you say, offline, but right back there in that storage locker, uh, I have the vinyls of Behold His Majesty, and uh, some other albums that we did there at Grace, and uh, another character in this whole equation, this guy named Bugsy, who worked for Maranatha for years, wonderful guy. Uh, at one point, Hosanna, I shouldn't get off on this tangent right now, but Hosanna was going to become part of Maranatha. In our infancy days, this is back around Hosanna 5, 6, 7, uh, it was sort of the papers were done. The papers were ready to be signed. And right at the last minute, uh, it was decided that, you know, we needed to go different ways. But uh, there is vinyl somewhere, and Bugsy's the one guy that knows where it is, uh, of Hosanna 5, which was Give Thanks, I think, right? And Hosanna 7, I forget what 7 was. I can tell you, although I have a cheat sheet in front of me, seven was, um, well, it depends how you count. No, 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 no. Seven was give thanks. Seven was yeah. give thanks. Five was glory to the king. Yeah. So those two records were pressed on vinyl by Maranatha, getting ready for these papers to be signed. And we were going to be, so in other words, there were the, 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 the praise series, which was, you know, their uh, primary series. They had praise strings, which was instrumental. We were going to be another parallel line. It was going to be the live component. And right at the last minute, uh, I think Pastor Chuck, who still kind of had an oversight thing over Maranatha, was kind of like, eh, these guys are just too too rowdy. <laughs> There's too much, uh, uh, again, whatever that word means, too, too, char too charismatic for their base, I think, is where it came down to. So... You may remember um, my late friend Chuck Fromm that worked for for Of Mary course, Trump. yeah. Yeah, he was on. Yeah, uh, yeah. Basically, Maranatha would be, in my mind, anyway, was Tommy Coombs and Chuck Fromm. They were the pillars of Maranatha. Yeah, Chuck, Chuck Fromm has touched so many things. Of course, CCLI and then Worship Leader Magazine. Worship Leader Magazine. He was sure. actually a, a reader on my doctoral dissertation, and ah. uh, love that guy. Love that guy. Yeah. No, I'm glad you took that tangent. A couple more technical questions. Um, were, were songs ever recorded 
again for other projects, or were the arrangements ever reused? Uh, songs, you know, th there are definitely songs that were recorded multiple times. Um, for me, I, n I always tried to not reuse the arrangement. If I was going to do a song again, I would, I, you know, I feel obligated as a musician to give it a fresh treatment. Like, why are you giving it to me again? Ah, that's why. You know, if it's uh, Jesus is alive, wow, there's a verse to that? I never knew that. So if I'm going to redo an arrangement, I'm going to definitely give you your money's worth as to why is it worth revisiting this. Um, I don't know that. Yeah, so songs were used again, yes, especially ones that were huge hits. Um, but yeah, I, I don't know that there were any arrangements that were reused verbatim. You know, you, you just touched on something, and I hadn't planned on asking this question or getting your comments on it, but um, as I look back at, uh, you know, older choruses and learning choruses, uh, there were churches that would adopt just a portion of a song, and I would have this experience as a young worship leader discovering that there's additional verses. So some songs that come to mind, um, one song, More Precious Than Silver by Linda Shazo, mm -hmm. has a verse to it, never knew that. Because um, I only ever heard the chorus, Lenny right. LeBlanc's There Is None Like You. I, for years, didn't know that there's a verse to that. Right. Um, we, would take the, we would take the tags of Call Him Up with the, the, the chorus, <laughs> Can't Stop Praising, and yeah. we would use that portion of the song, which is really a tag and a bridge. Uh, I've recently acquired the, uh, the Pentecostal record where that originated from in California, but from, from a song called Call Him Up and, and really didn't know until the Lift Him Up project came out that, there, whoa, there's a whole other section that's yeah. part of this song. So it's it's fascinating to me to see how songs develop. And, and one of the things I've always shared, too, with young songwriters is that there was no industry to profit from. And there were so many songs that would circulate back in the day. And the credit great point. Author unknown because people yeah. didn't care and they just wanted to see God glorified with their gifts. Yeah. No, Travis, that's a really, really great point. And uh Again, it's kind of like that explorer, pioneer, settler, entrepreneur thing. Um, back in the early days, yeah, almost the concept of ownership of a song, people didn't think in those terms. You know, it's kind of like God gave me the song. What am I going to do besides share this song? Uh, and again, as soon as it develops and as soon as the entrepreneur guys come and the business guys come and... and and again, you know, we're in our little firehouse on the concrete cross-legged on the floor thing. Once you get out in the world and you start distributing things, it's like publishing. What do you mean publishing? What do you mean copyright? Uh, but the thing I kind of love, this is my journey anyway. Humanity does exactly what you said. Humanity will take a creative thing and they'll grab the stuff that's really good. Like you grab the tags from that song. And that worked in your setting. And therefore, you sort of like made your own version. It felt right for your setting. So there's real life in it, you know. And then somebody else does it a different way. And they discover uh, something else. And then, you know, those guys cross-pollinate. So I kind of love the fact that when humanity does the editing, <laughs> you got to kind of say, all right, maybe that's the way it should be. Versus like a couple of guys in a room who think they know determining how much the audience should hear and how much they shouldn't hear. Uh, so it definitely morphed from the early days into a publishing thing. Who's the songwriter? What's the songwriting share? Oh, you publish with them. You publish with them. So now it's a co-publishing thing. And OK, if we're going to put songs on a record, don't we want to use the songs that we publish? Because if we use the songs that we don't publish, it changes the dollars and the so all of a sudden, instead of us sitting in a room going, what are the anointed songs for this album? Yeah, there's some other stuff thrown into that conversation, right? And again, like the God, what songs should we pick? It's a pretty pure motivation. When it's like, God, tell us what songs to pick. What are the songs that we publish out of this group? You know, what's our relationship with that? It starts to cloud up just a little bit. How many Hosanna projects, Tom, were truly recorded live, and what types of things would be overdubbed and added later in post-production? 
All right, Travis, now you're diving into the nitty gritty. Asking for your secrets, Tom. Yeah. So here, here's the way I look at it. Um, I mean, actually, a good way to describe this is sort of like two sides of a mountain, right? So he, here's this mountain. All the way over here at the bottom is just totally live. Throw up some microphones straight to a master two-track. Grab it, and that's it. And then, like, over here on this side of the mountain is let's go into the studio and let's do a completely studio album. Let's get it top quality. We'll take and take and take till we get it right, and then we'll fix what we need to. Okay, so you can climb up either side of that mountain. You can start with the live, and as you get up here, you can say, okay, we've captured all the live stuff. You know, the, you know, a fly hit you in the cheek, and you know, we missed that line of that verse. So we can go back into the studio and fix that. Climb a little bit higher, it's kind of like, well, you know what? You know, you kind of had something caught in your throat that whole song. Maybe we should just recut that whole song. It'll match better. You know, there's a lot of drum spill on the background vocals. You know, now we're getting up toward the peak of that mountain. So you get over the crest of that mountain, and it's kind of like, gosh, wouldn't we be better off just going to the studio first? Let's record all this, and then maybe let's bring those tracks out to a live setting. So all of that, all of those combo things are sort of all around the crest of that mountain, you know? So the short answer to the question is we always try to stay on the live side of the mountain where it originated well in the live thing. And the whole point of that was we're here to document. We're here to chronicle. We're here to capture something God's doing. That's not to say God can't work in the studio, but it's that human editing thing. I like putting the song out to the people and letting them sort of respond in a way that says, this is hitting me right in the heart. You know, So I always prefer to start there rather than be the laboratory guys in the room who make their arbitrary decisions and decide what needs to happen. So, but yes, there's always a certain amount of fixing. Some albums had more, some al albums had less, but I always try to lean on the side of the classic one. You know, there was a line in some Ron Canoli album where might have been I See the Lord, where he was so caught up that he just completely broke down in the middle of a vocal line. And it's like one guy in the meeting room on that mix day is kind of like, well, Tom, why didn't you fix that? Don't we need to fix that? And I'm saying, I don't know that that needs to be fixed because when I hear that line, it causes me to break up. I sense what's going on in the fact that he couldn't even finish that line. He choked up and his voice just like, you know what I'm saying? I mean, I'm getting as I describe it. So, you know, it's like God's version of perfect versus the world's version of perfect. Um, yeah, so I always, I, I treated these tracks like awfully, you know, kind of a sacred way. You know, if something happened on the live night, before I would change it or fix it, I'm a little bit like, you know, God, did you want it that way? So some of those albums are pretty loosey-goosey when I listen back to them, but it's kind of what it was. What projects do you remember having some of the greatest challenges? Well, uh, you know, God has a sense of humor about, uh, you know, as soon as your faith grows a little bit, it's kind of like, ah, you think you got it? Uh, let me throw this one at you and see how you do. Uh, every one of these albums had its own unique challenge. The, the one... When you ask that question, Travis, the one that pops into mind is, uh, this was in Atlanta. It was a Ron Canoli record, um, God is Able, I think. Um, it was one of those situations where it's a pretty big production album. Uh, some of the albums that we did video, it's not like recording an album in a public convention center with a whole new church and a whole new group of people and two semi-tractor trailer remote trucks. Now, let's add video. <laughs> so this is one of those that we added video on top of that. And, uh, you know, we'd work for months to prepare. We're on stage. 
This is in the Atlanta Convention Center, which happens to be a very tightly union-controlled hall. Fine. I mean, we knew that. We made plans. But we had some church volunteers that were helping us as ushers, as car parkers, as, you know, helping us move some heavy equipment around. And the union guys just said, absolutely not. That's a violation of our code here. We're shutting this thing down. Now, this is like an hour before the event starts. There's a line of people wrapped around this building, ready to get in the front door. And these guys are saying, no, you're done. We're pulling the plug. So it's a little bit of a challenge, right? You know, we've got boatloads of money invested. You know, we've brought in all these remote trucks and all these video trucks and hired these technicians and rented this hall. And that was the moment when you know, this, this is a big one. You know, we, I forget whose idea it was, but we kind of took all of our charts. At that point, we're talking paper. Uh, and we brought them out into the center of the stage, right behind Ron's mic. And we set them down in a big pile. And we circled that pile. And basically, I forget who prayed it. it Might have been me. But just like God, if you want to send down a bolt of lightning and just turn all this preparation into ashes just set it on fire we want your plan here because right now the best of our plan is like a train wreck you know now we think we've followed you with every note on every page and every choice we've made but obviously we're in trouble so if you have another plan that's going to be better than our plan we want to follow your plan and that was very much a unanimous you know holding the hand. There's nobody in the hall yet. The hall is completely empty. And that was one of those desperation prayers. And I honestly don't know what happened, how it happened to this day, but somehow or other, the doors opened and people flooded in. And so that's the sense that I'm counting off the first song of that night. <laughs> and, uh, as a result of that, you know, when I watch this video to that day and I see Abe just, bass player Abraham Laboya, fall down on his knees in the middle of a little solo spot I gave him, or I see Ron just being completely overwhelmed. And when I see that stuff, it's like really obviously why. We, we were just in awe of how God had just answered our prayer. So, so, Tom, how many projects did you do for Integrity Music Total? Have you ever tried to count? Uh, that's a great question, Travis. I, uh, I think it's in the area of like 137, somebody told me one time. Um, you know, in addition to the, uh, the one every eight weeks, we also did a whole line of instrumental albums. Uh, we did <clears throat> some albums that never really even came out. Uh, that you know were somewhat uh, experimental. We did uh, we did choral projects. You know we did some orchestral arrangements. You know the arrangements from the albums. So we produced a lot of things that were kind of ancillary to the albums, different lines of albums. Uh, but uh, yeah, somebody told me once it's like 137 ish. And your start time with Hosanna is you know. If you can't behold his majesty around 82, 83, up until when did you stop? Um, th there was never really a cold stop per se. Uh, I mean, we, uh, uh, you know, well into the 2000s, you know, we were still doing projects for them. Um, you know, I, I, th I think the general thought process was, uh, and I can completely understand this, after a while, especially at that pace, uh, you know, as much as I would sort of try to approach things differently, uh, you know, my approach is going to start to sound like my approach. So just to have some variety after that many albums, uh, they felt, you know, the, the need to get some other people involved. Totally get that. Totally fine with that. Um, and, you know, stuff just changes. Uh, integrity went from the four of us in the beginning I think at one point they had 150 employees. Uh, you know, they'd brought in 
as, as things got quite big, you know, they brought in some people from Disney, they brought in some people from the industry. Uh, so there were several different kind of contingencies that came in as things developed. So it's almost like to get a snapshot, you almost have to decide what period of time in history are we going to take the snapshot uh, because it, it morphed over time. But yeah, I mean, my, my consistent work for them probably ended, you know, in the early 2000s. That's really remarkable, Tom. And I know you're a humble guy and you would never, um, you would never look for an accolade, but uh, truth be told, you really helped to define the sound of a genre. And when you look at how these albums, man, not only influenced the church and gave words and expression to people's hearts, but you look at just how the Lord took some of these projects and these songs around the globe, you really can't underestimate the way that the Lord shone through your gifting and your talent. And, and I just think that's remarkable. I wanted to... Well, you're, you're, you're really kind to say that, Travis. And, uh, you know, my comeback would be, and, and I know the other guys, you know, some of these worship leader guys would say the same thing. It really is, there's no better feeling. I know you know this. There's no better feeling than to feel like God is working through you. God is using your hands and your feet to accomplish something that really he wants to accomplish. And that, you know, I think for every believer, that's, that's when you know you're lined up. That's when you know you're in sync with God's heart, when you get that feeling. And so much of this was really that. And in a lot of ways, you know, every eight weeks, there was a human, human nature, ego side of me that often wanted to say, man, I don't, this is not ready to turn in. You know, I want to make this sound better. You know, I've got a pile of ideas here on the cutting room floor that you're not giving me time to do. And when you really give something over to God like that, you kind of have to, again, you got to have the open hands. And, uh, you know, I mean, I'm completely happy with the way that journey went. Uh, you know, there were times when I would listen to a final mix and it's kind of like, that's my scratch piano there. You know, I mean, how did we ever release that? Well, it's because the deadline came and we had to go to something else, you know. So there is a side of that that, you know, you just got to go, God, this is really for you. It's not about me. And I'm happy to serve in whatever way you want me to. And when I look at what he did, I'm really happy to step out of the way and just sort of let God take center stage. And... That's awesome. As you look back on decades of live worship projects for Hosanna Music, um, and, and really thousands of, of songs, you got the songs that made the project, but you also have all these other songs. And we talked earlier, Bert, about, um, you know, demoed songs that jumped out mm -hmm. at you. Were there ever any songs or projects that you were mixing at your console that you just found yourself drawn into worship and just felt your spirit saying, that song, this project is touching me, even as I'm mixing it? Is, is there a project uh, or even a song that, that would fit that? Yeah, I mean, my, my first instinctive answer is like all the time. <laughs> um, I mean, that, that was really my guide. You know, when I'm mixing this thing, I'm in the background, I'm mixing technically, but really what I'm looking for is that feeling that you just described. And if I'm not having that feeling, then it's like, what, what needs to be adjusted then? You know, where did we, where did we miss on this? And yeah, I mean, every one of these albums definitely had moments that started off in that meeting that we just talked about with me and Don Moen and Mike Coleman and Ed Lindquist listening to that homemade cassette demo and going, wow, I've, I've never heard it said that way. That's a powerful, man, that puts, that's a song right there. And then following that through the arranging process, following that through the live production. Did we get it? Did we capture it? Is it really a strong? And then mixing it. And yeah, you know, I mean, that that's, that's my QC. That's my quality control. If I still have that feeling by the time it gets to the end, 
it's kind of like, God, did we hit it? And, you know, if he says, well done, good and faithful servant, man, that's, a, that's can't ask for any more than that. For me, I think of projects like uh, Randy Rothwell's Be Magnified. I think of, um, <laughs> you know. Randy uh, Rothwell. That's, that's a name I forgot. One of my favorites. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> think of The Lord Reigns by Bob Fitz. But on those yeah. projects, like, there doesn't seem to be a bad song. And that's not just a preferential-based thing, but as you kind of analyze how those songs were used across the nation, there are projects, and you know this as a producer, there's, there's kind of, there is this element of kind of hit and miss in what resonates with the global church. And mm -hmm. I can think of a handful of Hosanna projects that beginning to end, there were just song after song. Give you mentioned the Give Thanks project. Song after song were, were adopted by churches around the globe. Yeah, yeah. I think a lot of it has to do with just the the strength of the the message from God, the scripture content. Uh, you mentioned a good point about universal appeal. There are some, you know, there's some cultural hot buttons, but then there are other truths that are just really universal that people all over the world deal with. And when God offers a solution, it doesn't matter what culture you're in, uh, you know, to feel loved, you know, to just feel his peace in a stressful world. There's, and when you find a song that really delivers a universal truth like that, you know if it's set in a powerful way with a melody that just gets inside of your heart and your spirit, that that's going to, touch the world in any language. Are there any songs that you wish were recorded but never made a project? And were, were there any complete projects that never saw the light of day? There, there actually are a few. So again, back in that uh, storage area right back there, uh, I have masters to some albums that uh, where we had just decided we're going to do this a different way. We're going to uh, we're not going to do it live. We're going to go into the studio and we're going to bring 10 of our favorite all-time, you know, worship leader, artist type people and do a studio album. And we did several of those with the thought in mind that was going to be a whole nother line in parallel. Uh, I forget what it was called. It had a working title even, but uh, none of those albums were ever released. And there's some incredible songs on those albums. Uh, Matthew Ward from Second Chapter of Acts, uh, Kelly Willard, Jeff Hamlin had a great song on one of those. So yeah, there are some cuts that have never seen the light of day that I think are, are terrific, but they they weren't uh, they weren't in the live Hosanna vein per se, but some great songs. You know something that's been powerful. You mentioned some of the um, the Ron Canoli videos that were done. Something that's really powerful to me is just looking at the lineup of the vocalists that are singing on some of those records, Alicia Williamson-Garcia, Paul Balash, uh, Lenny LeBlanc. Um, you mentioned Matthew Ward from Second Chapter of Acts, Kelly Willard, uh, Leanne Manchow, Albrecht, Leanne Rick Manchow, Albrecht. All, all people whose personalities and influence could demand projects of their own, and here they are faithfully just contributing with yeah. no sense of entitlement, happy to be in the background of anonymity. And yeah. just serving the Lord, and and what a what a great team of people, people who you know you look at the Kelly Willard laying down foundations for CCM, yeah, big time. Yeah, I uh, yeah, we were talking about the that Ron Canoli project in Atlanta. Um, there are a couple of vocal improv things that Matthew Ward did. Uh, one of the most amazing singers in the world. I'll say that. Uh, there's some vocal improv things that he did during that night, just kind of off the cuff that just are spine chilling, uh, inspiring. Uh, yeah. And Paul Balash, you know, I see him before we ever did an album with Paul, you know, I see him in the background group along next to his wife, Rita, another incredible singer, worship leader, songwriter, Leanne, my buddy, Rick Machow, uh, Lots of great, great people who were just, you know, Tom, put me in the game, coach, whatever you want me to do. And just, you know, again, it, it's part of that thing of like, you know, every church, when you gather the people together, you're not looking for the most gifted singer. You're not looking for the it girl. You're looking for people that have a heart to serve with you. 
And, you know, I'm looking around the stage, you know, a few minutes before we're counting off the downbeat for one of those nights. And I'm just saying, man, every one of these people got my back, you know, like I, there's nobody else I would rather have on this stage than this collection of people. Carl Albrecht on the drums played more albums for me than anybody on the planet. Nobody more faithful, more qualified, just a tremendous soul. He, he and I, my favorite story about uh, Carl, he hates it when I say this, but our moms used to drive us to sessions because we were too young to drive when we started playing together. <laughs> Um, I mean, that's how long I've known Carl, and, and he's still the backbone of a lot of incredible uh, contemporary praise and worship stuff, contemporary Christian stuff. So, yeah, it's a collection of people. It's a family of like-minded, like-hearted people. That's the beginning of every great worship team, for sure. That's such a great principle for um, worship leaders, perhaps watching this interview, to hear and to let really permeate their hearts. So we talked a little bit about song, songwriters. Songwriters are sometimes, you know, the unsung uh, heroes behind a project because they're providing the songs. You know, there is no project without a song. It all starts with a song. Um, who were some of the songwriters whose names we wouldn't know maybe as well as worship leaders, but who were regularly having their songs cut on Hosanna projects? Yeah, that's a that's a great question, Travis. Uh, the first name that pops into mind is a guy named Billy Funk, probably nobody's ever heard of. Uh, Billy was, is still uh, a great songwriter. He wrote a bunch of hits in a season there. Uh, the other funny one that comes to mind is Paul Balash. In the early days, before we ever considered him as a worship leader, uh, he was writing, I mean, I would say to this day, he may have written more songs on for integrity music than any other writer that exists. Uh, I could be wrong about that, but I, I would bet my money on Paul. So for a long, long time, we harvested his songs when nobody knew who he was. In fact, he even had a business card where he had the pronunciation of his name spelled out because nobody knew who he was. Nobody knew how to pronounce it. Uh, but then, of course, when uh, you know when we did do an album with him. Uh, you know, he became an instant you know, worship leader that people loved, and obviously that gave him another vehicle to do more songs. Um, but yeah, Paul's a great one, still a great friend to this day, and one of the best songwriters in the whole genre, I would say. What about Linda Shazo? Linda Shazo's another great one. Uh, more Precious Than Silver, I'd say it's one of the all-time classic songs. Uh, but she wrote a lot of other songs that are great. Lenny LeBlanc is another one that maybe a lot of people might not know. Terrific songwriter, terrific worship leader in his own right. Uh, yeah, there's a there's a laundry list, and I'm sure I'm leaving out a, a, a bunch of them. But um, yeah, you know, the, the songwriter and the worship leader, the combination of the two, uh, that's fairly rare, really. Um, you know, there are great, great songwriters. Ed Carr is another guy that comes to mind. Um, great songwriters, but maybe they just don't have that gift of worship leading. Great worship leaders, but maybe they don't have that gift of songwriting. So the combination of the two is actually pretty rare. But I concur with you a thousand percent. It all comes down to the song. Without the song, we've, we've got nothing. You know, a great so, worship yeah. leader with no words to sing, you got nothing. Well, you've mentioned you've mentioned Billy Funk. Um, let's um, let's uh, take a quick trip down memory lane. I got a I got a track off of Billy's record that he did called "See His Glory," and I believe this was recorded uh, in my home and native land, Canada. I believe this was recorded in Vancouver. Is that where Billy is from? Yeah, yeah, he, yeah. he's uh, he's from the Northland, and uh, I think it was Vancouver. Yeah. Yeah, so let's uh, let's pause and, and just uh, take a listen to this track real quick. This is a song I remember. This is uh, Sing, Shout, Clap by Billy Funk. Let there be glory in the house of the Lord. Shout that 
Now, I got to tell you a funny story. <laughs> I got to tell you a funny story about that song. And then I believe you have a funny story about Billy Funk to share. I grew up, <laughs> I grew up, my mind. I grew up in a church. God bless them. We were very white. So, so, you know, you know, playing chords with wild extensions on them or, you know, um, leaning into grooves that were more laid back was a real challenge for us. And uh, I'll never forget, I, I, I'd heard that song the way that we sang it in our very white Canadian, French Canadian church growing up. Um, and then I remember hearing the, the way it was recorded. I'm like, oh, this, this has a little bit of soul to it, though. The groove that it's, <laughs> I never knew it went like that. Only because in who we were, in our expression, we kind right. of, we did, we did our own little arrangement. But um, you have a funny story to share about Billy Funk as well. Tell us about that. When, I, when you mentioned Billy, the, uh, Billy's great. He, he's, uh, he's a little bit crazy. Like we're all a little bit crazy, right? But um, uh, I loved working with Billy because his energy was just absolutely boundless. And this is a situation where, kind of relating back to a question you asked before, um, in a lot of situations, we... Uh, we do re-record parts of the live vocal simply because the, not to get crazy technical, but you know, the vocal mic has a ton of spill of the band on it. And obviously the main vocal mic is something that's gonna be pretty hot in the mix. So um, oftentimes we would recut that and we're in the studio uh, recutting his vocal and my sweet elderly, somewhat elderly secretary at that time you know, would pop in with a message or this, that, and the other. And you could only see through the booth from about the waist up. And Billy's just Billy. You know, he's like salmon fishing one day and he's out hunting, you know, polar bears the next day. I don't know. But anyway, he, he kind of liked to work with his shirt off, you know. And because, uh, <laughs> you, know, <laughs> uh, you know, he's putting out energy, man. He's moving. And I know where this is going. Yeah. And, uh, and he had a funny thing that he would do just to kind of clear his throat out. Different singers have different things they do. Um, you know, if you're in Nashville, it's the Lay's potato chip thing. But anyway, he would, uh, he, he would take a little tiny shot of NyQuil. Uh, maybe he had a little cold or something, but he felt like that kind of helped him clear his throat out or something, right? So my, my secretary walks in when he's in the middle of, you know, kind of jumping, dancing around in the booth, shirtless. So oh, all, no. she, all, all she can see is his naked upper half. She has no idea what's going on below the window. Here. Taking shots of NyQuil, singing these worship songs. And I just kind of snapshotted that scene in my mind and saying, oh boy, you know. Just just a regular day cutting worship albums, Tom. Yeah, just a, just, just a regular day. <laughs> typical day in my home studio. But uh, oh man, yeah, well, Billy, Billy was always fun. There was not a moment with him that wasn't an absolute riot, and he wrote some incredible songs. You can hear it um, in his vocal, and uh, and you're right, great songwriter. Wrote the title track for "Lift Him Up" for Ron Canoli. Um, what about the, there's another song he wrote, a slower ballad that I'm bet, I'll bet you would know the name. Uh, uh, See his glory. That was the name of the record, but it was a song he wrote for Ron Canoli that is one of my all-time favorites that are it'll come to me in a little yeah bit. yeah he had a couple of cuts on on ron's albums uh one thing i've noticed is on the earlier projects it seems like there were many older choruses that would have copyrights from the 60s the 70s songs like ah lord god thou hast made the heavens and the earth uh, the trees of the field will clap their hands and others but yeah. the hosanna recordings of these older songs often became the definitive version why do you think that happened and what considerations were given that would lead you to re-record and find these older choruses and hymns for projects? Yeah. Um, yeah. Like we were talking earlier back in the day, there was, it wasn't very well organized. And uh, we started doing a thing where if we couldn't find who the writer was, because a lot of these songs would just go from, Sally goes to this conference and comes back with the song and teaches it to our church. And then that's just the way songs got around. Um, but we would set aside the royalties if we didn't know who the writer was as though 
just the same way that we would pay the person if we knew who it was. So there were a lot of, you know, you'd call it like an escrow account. And then if at one point we found that person, great, thank God. That's a great day. That's a great day for that yeah. songwriter. <laughs> but uh, uh, so, and, so we did that. And, thing. Yeah. Yeah. And, and in several of those cases, we, we did end up finding who those writers were. I think there may be a few songs floating around that nobody knows where they came from. But a, another of my favorites, I'm, I'm part of uh, Saddleback Church here. Uh, there's a very, very simple song. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. I'm going too fast, but Jesus, 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 modulate, he, 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 that. You know, that song, everybody just assumed, well, that's got to be public domain, right? Uh, but after years and years and years and years, uh, we did find who the writer was. And the writer is the couple that did salty the that would be um ernie retino, ernie retino. so debbie, debbie, retino. Re debbie retino actually wrote that song but for years and years and years all these albums came out with that as public domain and uh debbie's another one of those great debbie and ernie both wonderful people in the family of god but uh yeah, debbie's sort of like uh hey Everybody, uh, that's mine. Send, and, send the uh, checks this way. <laughs> yeah. So eventually, eventually we did, uh, and and everybody, you know, finally got that credited to her. But uh, yeah, you know, it's obviously much better organized now. Publishing companies, it's much done in a more business-like manner. But in the early days, it was it was kind of kind of loose. Yeah, when you were choosing some of these older songs that had existed, um, were, were were they were they like songs like "Al or God" or "The Trees of the Field" that would kind of fall into the you know the, they were written in the middle of the twentieth century? Would would there be previous recordings of them that you would draw upon and be like, we should record that? That's a pretty popular song. Or was the worship leader coming and saying, hey, the, we should we should record this? Yeah, uh, very rarely. Like I don't remember a time where we ever accessed. A, uh, a recording. It was much more like uh, a guest would come in and sing this song uh, at our church and we would love it. Or we're out at a conference and we hear this song. Uh, it was much more that way. The uh, A lot of times what we would do on a night of a recording, we might have the local worship team, you know, they might do a set before we would come on and do the actual recorded set. So a lot of times, you know, we, we got the very best of every church that we went to every eight weeks. So it's kind of like we always came away from that church with another idea. In a, in a way, you know, this probably wasn't the, the best thing, but we would go to that church, hear a great song. And then instead of it showing up on their album, because we just finished the album there, it would show up on some other church's album. And then the songs we got from there would show up. So, uh, yeah, they... In some, but again, you know, we would say our job was to cross pollinate. So, uh, but very fascinating. Well, yeah. a project that we've talked about a number of times in this conversation has been "Give Thanks," which was the first Hosanna record to go gold. It kind of introduced yeah. the world to to Don Moen, and uh, I want to um, I want to play a, a quick clip. Uh, everyone knows the title song, but this is another track off of Give Thanks. This is uh, What a Mighty God We Serve. Let's have a quick listen. <laughs> Okay, so there, there's a principle in songwriting that if the song is really short and there's not much to it, you, you got a couple of tools in your tool belt, but but you can only go a, a certain direction. And so 
So Tom, do you know what the acronym KCPM stands for? Well, if your reaction to that song is the same as mine, the, the first thing that comes to mind is you don't hear a, a lot of key change anymore. So what, what, what was the acronym again? K the acronym is KCPM, and you're on to it. Do, do you know so what that's? Key change PM, something modulation. Key change per minute. Key change per minute, okay. And I know you have a sense of humor, but I, I have to ask, <laughs> what what responsibility in modern worship culture do you take for KCPM and medley fatigue? Because to your point, you know, no. it's like it was so commonplace on these records. Like, and, and any of us that have studied music with, with, with a great deal of sincerity and seriousness would like – it's a it's a very recognized thing that the way that you elevate a composition, if you look at the history of music, is is yeah. through key change. But but the world, like you, you do not see it much anymore, at least in worship. No, you don't. Why do you think we've moved away from using key change as a normalized dynamic to lift a song? Yeah, um, you know the the fun thing about once you've you know made the trip around the sun a few times, you you start to see waves in history, you know. So, you know, sometimes I'm, I'm a guy that saves everything. And part of the reason I do is, is just because it sort of helps me see the world a little bit like God does when you can see these waves, you know. So, you know, you get your bell-bottom jeans, right? And then after you get so much of those, then it's got to be skinny jeans, right? Nobody would be caught dead in bell-bottoms. And then when you've had enough of skinny jeans, all of a sudden, and these cycles are 15, 20 year cycles, you know, bell bottoms are back in a rage right now, you know, and it's kind of like that with modulation. I think uh, once you've had a steady diet of it for a long, long time, it kind of loses its, uh, you know, you could say the same thing about the McRib <laughs> at McDonald's, you know, like. It's a season, but man, once you've had enough of it, it's like, yeah, you know, let's give me a salad, you know, give me something else again. So I kind of think modulation did that right now. You wouldn't be caught dead modulating in a pop song. Uh, and again, you know, when I listen to that, you know, that's got to be circa 1980 something. Uh, it even strikes me a little bit comical. But yeah, you know, basically the entire content of that song lasts about 20 seconds. At that tempo, that's about 120. You know, it's a 16-bar chorus. It's about 20 seconds. So, as an arranger, what are you going to do? Uh, but yeah, that the, those modulations are a little bit much even for me right now. <laughs> what responsibility, Tom, did you have in creating musical and vocal arrangements for the projects? And did any of these uh, need to be simplified? For the accompanying song sheets so that local churches could actually reproduce some of what they would hear on these records so i, I think of some of the complexities of some yeah. of cannoli's records um talk to me a little bit about that yeah no, that's a great question um you know i did supervise all those song books and uh i i did have a guy that was helping me do them but uh that was a tough question so first of all, all the arrangements of any of my albums were me. So all of the vocals and the band and the charts and everything were mine. Um, so I guess, you know, I get blame or credit depending on your point of view, right? Um, in, in all honesty, if I separated myself as a producer of Hosanna songs and as a worship director in a church, um, you know, we, we sort of got known and people told us that they liked by what they bought. Uh, I mean, they loved Ron's albums and they loved the directions that those went. So, you know, we were, I was, I guess, kind of chasing a, a sort of a neo soul gospel jazz kind of thing with Ron that I wouldn't have chased with Don Moen, for instance. I mean, I was doing those albums simultaneously, but, you know, Don, you know, very much strikes me as, a, you know, he's a, he's a triad guy, you know, whereas Ron's thing really, the, the kind of gospel jazz neo soul thing 
fit him. So that's like more extended chords. But yeah, you know, as I'm going that direction, I mean, I love those albums. I love that harmonic richness. But as a, you know, as a music director guy, I'm saying, you know, can I get my young players to hit all those changes accurately? That's a lot to ask, you know. So, yeah, I mean, I'm sort of critiquing myself in a way. But uh, obviously, from a listening standpoint, that those albums supported Ron in a really, really great way. In terms of a feeding songs to the church way, we yeah, we might have gotten uh, veered off the path a little bit from that. You know, depending on what you're looking for. Are you looking for a great album that's inspiring to listen to, or are you really looking for songs that you can grab and do in your church? So trying to balance those two. For sure, for sure.